Hey English 75A, welcome back. Today I'll be giving you some quick notes about Emily Dickinson. Now, um, Emily Dickinson is a really important figure in American literature, um, and especially in American poetry. She's a very crucial turn of the century figure, um, as Walt Whitman was, but structurally they're very, very different. Thematically, some of their material is similar. Um, we could write a whole paper on that, I think. But let's get into some of her biographical info. Um, she was born in Amherst, and she never married, so she lived there for every year of her life, even as an adult. Um, she made it to 56 years old. Um, but that was it, and part of the reason for that was she never married. Now, she may have had a relationship with a man. She may have had a relationship with a close friend who was a woman. Um, there's some biographical debate about that information. Um, there was a movie that just came out called The Wild Nights, Wild Nights, based on one of the poems we were to read for this section. And... Um, in some ways, it's about love and passion in a way that is more direct than you'll see in a lot of Emily Dickinson's work. Now, in Walt Whitman, on the other hand, he made it pretty clear when he was talking about desire or when he was talking about sexuality. Um, the woman watching all of the men, young men bathing in the pond and stuff like that. Oh, it looks like uh, my daughter's coming back home from her run. All right. And what is very different about Emily Dickinson from Walt Whitman is that even though Walt Whitman was talking about his inner life or somebody's inner life, he was also about everything around him in American culture, right? He made these beautiful, long, epic catalogs about the average people that you would meet in the city or about different kinds of people, um, heroes and uh, criminals and everybody in between. And there's, la there's no real judgment placed on any of that. Emily Dickinson um, creates a poetic voice that is very internalized and is about her rich inner life and is really about subjectivity and subjective experience in a way that Whitman is not. And she's got this very distinctive style called the Fourteener. And the Fourteener is a phrase that literary critics have given to these tiny stanzas that she made with only three or four beats per line. And um, so we're looking at six or eight syllables. And um, this was a structure that was usu usually reserved for, up until this point, for um, different kinds of genres, you know, um, church songs or hymns, um, traditional folk ballads, and even nursery rhymes. So she takes this sing-songy um, kind of genre form and turns it inward upon um, the workings of this poetic voice, which some people will often say is her, but there's no real way for, to know for sure. That's something we need to keep in mind. When somebody writes a poem, we can't always just assume that the poem represents some kind of truth from that author and represents their point of view. It very well could, but that's not necessarily the case. Now, when she uh, wrote these poems, structurally, what's important for us to realize is that she uses this um, very new and innovative kind of uh, phraseology. Um, she'll often use small little phrases with dashes in between, and those dashes can drive people crazy sometimes, but they also allow for a, a lot of subtlety and nuance and meaning and interpretation. Um, her punctuation, of course, is very irregular. Um, she uses slant rhymes. That means imperfect rhymes in order to um, help people 
I mean, to help open up her form and make the ideas to be something um, that take precedence over tight rhyming structure. So in a way, Dickinson and Whitman are throwing away rhyming structure, uh, poetic meter uh, and rhyme in a way that really hails forward to a new era of contemporary poetry that's, that's really never left uh, uh, since that point. So I'll jump through a few poems just so you kind of get an idea um, of what she's like. And I'm looking at 207 on page 1661. Um, notice they're all um, numbered. She didn't really give titles to her poems. Um, and that uh, is pretty standard for the way she gets organized. Some people will use the, the first line of the poem um, as the title. And it really depends on who's talking about it and what their purpose is. Um, but these numbers were all given on how her poems are found. She had very few poems pu published during her lifetime. Um, the times she did submit, um, for lack of better words, she was dissed pretty hard. Uh, and that's because her poetry looked so different what was from what was considered to be popular and good, competent poetry in her time. But that's how revolutionaries and iconoclasts sometimes are seen during the moment in which they are creating. They're so far ahead and they're so different that people automatically judge them as inferior or unskilled or outside. Now, of course, Emily, Con Emily Dickinson is considered a giant in American poetry, and the contemporaries uh, with which you know she was compared, you know, and considered inferior to, a lot of them have really faded through history. So, if we look at page two hundred seven, um, there's a poem. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, page sixteen sixty one, poem two hundred seven starts like this. Um, it's three stanzas. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. Pearl alcohol. That's a very, very slanty rhyme. They basically only have the L at the end producing any kind of similarity in sound. Inebriate of air am I and debauchee of dew reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So, theme of nature and how nature is important and its relationship to divinity or spirituality or God is really important here. It should maybe remind us a little bit of transcendentalism here. And that strong interior experience, that subjectivity, also will remind us of that and of Romanticism. Now, she does capitalize some of her, ver some of her nouns. That's a very old school 18th century move. She's doing it for some reason. Um, still popular to do in other European languages. German capitalizes all its nouns, for example. And that still goes on today. That first stanza, she's saying she's tasting a liquor that was never brewed um, from tankard scooped in pearl. Um, not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. Here she's saying that she's drinking some kind of liquor, um, some kind of booze, um, but it isn't made from Frankfurt berries. Now, Frankfurt berries are also known as juniper berries. And juniper berries are one of those um, organic uh, herbal uh, supplements that is used to flavor gin. So she's saying she's drinking this liquor that was never brewed in the traditional way. And, you know, even, you know, these gin berries don't make, you know, anywhere near as good an alcohol. So we should probably have our, um, our radar up that she might be working on some kind of a metaphor here. Um, 
employing that sift structure we've used before um, is going to be really important for us to really dig down deep into Dickinson's poems. Even though the words she's using are often very common and very simplistic, she could be challenging to get the, uh, the meaning out of. Inebriate of air am I, and debauche of dew, reeling through summer, endless summer days from inns of molten blue. Inebriate, that's just another word for a drunkard. You know, we, we probably know that form better in inebriation. And debauche of dew. Debauche means a person who gauges in debauchery. So she's drunk on air. She is drunk or in debauchery because of dew that she sees in nature. And she's reeling through these summer days of inns of molten blue, which you could see as being, you know, a beautiful blue sky. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when the seasons maybe ha make the bees go away, you know, foxglove is kind of flower. When butterflies uh, renounce their drams, when they stop drinking also, I shall but drink the more. So even though the seasons change, I'm still there. I'm still sucking it in. I'm still drunk or high off of the gorgeous sensory experience of nature. She's going to keep on drinking until seraphs swing their snowy hats. So seraphs are angels and they're wearing some kind of snowy hats. Maybe that just means like the snow settling on mountains or something like that. Notice we have that alliteration in that line. Seraphs swing snowy and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. Now tipple means, you know, a person who drinks a little bit and through this, these tiny little sips of drinking gets a little bit buzzed. You could say that the, the voice of this poem is this little tippler and they're having that happy kind of warm buzzed moment. You know, when you maybe you lean on somebody and you're like, this guy, I love this guy, this guy's the best guy, but she's doing it with the sun. So in other words, it's about being in this ecstatic physical experience, like being, you know, intoxicated, but in a good and positive way. Um, without hangovers and such, just because of the power and the beauty of nature. Now, 236 is also about nature. And she basically says in 236 on page 1662 that nature is her church and nature is her, her religion. I am going to go ahead and let you do that one on your own there. Um, on page 1664, we, we have the poem 269, which is Wild Nights. Wild Nights, Wild Nights, where I with thee, Wild Nights, should be our luxury. Feudal the winds to a heart and port, done with a compass, done with a chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, but might I but more tonight in thee. So basically, we have get this other extended uh, metaphor of being a boat um, and rowing and um, being in port as similar to being in love or being in, you know, a loving relationship. And that second one, second uh, stanza, she says, Feudal the winds to a heart in port, done with a compass, done with a chart. So she's basically saying the winds, which might be things that distract you or other negative emotions, those can't hurt a heart that is in port, a heart that is in its place of safety, like a ship when the ship is in the port. And you don't need a compass or a chart there because you know where you're going and you know where you are. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea. Now, rowing is, you know, very strenuous action. And some literary critics see this as actually meaning something like, uh, a physical encounter, uh, maybe even sex. And the sea is often seen as, you know, a, a symbol of uh, unbounded sexuality. Might I but more tonight pull into port in thee? And I don't think I have to explain that one any more than that. Um, that just about brings me up to time. Um, I'll do a few more in the next video, just so you get a better handle of it.